to invite Lord Alderdice to give some opening remarks as well. Uh, Lord Alderdice is the chairman of the Centre for Democracy and Peacebuilding. He's our co-organising partner this year. He's also a senior fellow and executive director of the Centre for the Resolution of Intractable Conflict at Harris Manchester College in Oxford University. And indeed, one of the architects of the Irish peace process and a former speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly. So Lord Alderdice. Thank you very much indeed, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to Belfast. It's great to be working uh, with our friends and colleagues in the University of Ulster uh, and uh, Vice-Chancellor, Pro-Vice-Chancellor. Uh, it's uh, always a pleasure to work with old friends like Brandon and Duncan and Tim and others. Um, and, and those of us in the Centre for Democracy and Peacebuilding, uh, we're very excited about the possibility of build peace coming to Belfast. Eva was out in Colombia because we've been working there for some time and saw the tremendous work that you did in Bogota. And she contacted me and said, we really need to bring this to Belfast. And I said, well, Eva, there's nobody better to do it than yourself. And so she engaged with you, you and with lots of other organizations, as, as you will have seen. And, and I need to tell you, Eva, who's the chief executive of our Centre for Democracy and Peacebuilding, um, you, you know the advertisements for the Duracell bunny? Well, he's a real slacker in comparison with Eva. She's an extraordinary producer of ideas and of delivering those ideas, which of course is uh, not the same thing as just producing the ideas for other people to deliver. So Eva, I'd like to thank you very much indeed, for both for the initiative of working with, uh, with Build Peace and also for delivering it. Tremendous success, and I was delighted to see you being recognized as an ambassador for Belfast along with Tim. Congratulations and thank you very much indeed. Uh, talking of ambassadors, we have the new Polish uh, consul with us today, Excellency. Lovely to see you. We've had a very good relationship with, uh, not just with your predis with the, the Polish embassy in London and, and, and others who've been working, but with the diplomatic community in general, because all of us realize that we're living in a world which is a difficult, contentious, troubled place at the moment. And uh, all of you will have connections with, indeed, in some cases, have come from places where there's been a lot of difficulty. We don't tend to think in the here and now of somewhere like Poland as having been difficult. But the problems of the history of Poland are extraordinary, right up to and through and beyond the Second World War. All sorts of very painful, difficult things happen for Polish people. And I think that's one of the things uh, that, that, that meant that Polish people got on well with folk in Northern Ireland. Because one of the things I discovered in working in places of conflict all around the world is that those who have been through conflict emotionally understand others who have been through conflict much better than people who come from peaceful, stable parts of the world. Uh, when I've had friends and colleagues coming from other places to work here in Northern Ireland, and they come from peaceful, stable places, places like, I was going to say the United States, maybe that's not so stable as it used to be, or Scandinavia, they work very hard to try to understand it. But when I have colleagues coming from places like Lebanon or the Balkans or some parts of sub-Saharan Africa, emotionally, they immediately get a sense. They don't need to know all the details. They just get a feeling and a sense of the challenge and the problems because they've been through similar kinds of things. That's one of the things that we began to discover in, in Northern Ireland as we tried to develop a peace process. You see, we didn't develop a peace process and a Good Friday Agreement because we were smart. It's because we tried everything else. You know what Winston Churchill said about the Americans. He said, I love the Americans. They always do the right thing, but only after they have exhausted all the other possibilities. Well, that was us for hundreds and hundreds of years. We had great difficulty in addressing our problems, and we find ourselves turning to violence to deliver in the context of anger and frustration and humiliation and disrespect and a sense of unfairness. And eventually we came to realize that, that actually our problem wasn't rules and regulations and constitutions and flags. Our problem was disturbed historic relationships between communities of people. Not just between individual people. Lots of individual people got on very well with each other. But that didn't solve the problem. The problem was at a different systemic level. It was at the level of communities that weren't getting on together. And you could try very hard to build individual relationships across those dividing lines. 
but it didn't solve the problem. And so we started to try to understand, well, what were the disturbed historic relationships? Well, obviously within Northern Ireland, Protestants and Catholics, Unionists and Nationalists, and, and also North-South, and indeed East-West between Britain and Ireland. And there were other important relationships, not contentious, but supportive ones, like the relationship with the United States, or the relationship with the rest of the European Union. In fact, the relationship with the rest of the European Union was very important for us because it, it brought Britain and Ireland together in that new context. We joined on the 1st of January 1973, the same day, the same time, and it helped to bring politicians and civil servants and others together. And eventually, people began to say, you know, it is possible to find a way forward here if we find a way of addressing our relationships. So our peace process was built in a very different way from most other peace processes because it, it analyzed the relationships and then said, now let's bring together the relevant people for each of those relationships. We won't bring everybody involved around the table at the one time, but we'll bring unionist and nationalist and other leaders together for strand one, looking at the divisions within the North. And then we'll bring in the southern government once we start looking at north-south things. And when we're looking at east-west, it'll be London and Dublin, but not the politicians and representatives from Northern Ireland. And of course, there were the other relationships with, with the EU and, and the United States. And as we worked in this kind of way, it began to become possible, first of all, to, to steady things up, and, and then to look at, at political arrangements, and security arrangements, and social and economic development, and community development. Human rights was a really important part of it. And, and we went through lots and lots of things that you'll be familiar with, practical, political, structural issues. And eventually, with a great deal of difficulty and a lot of time, we began to be able to address those and get an agreement. But you know, we discovered something that we hadn't really expected. And that was that it was possible to do all of these things, tick all of those boxes, address all of those things that you would see in conflict resolution programs all around the world. But one thing hadn't actually changed very much, and that was people's attitudes as a community. You know, when we think about you as a person, when you think about you, we call it your personality. You have a particular way of being in the world. Not just how you think and how you feel and how you act, but all of these things together and your relationships. And we call it personality. Well, when a whole community has a way of being in the world, we call it culture. And we think about lots of the different aspects of that culture, but culture is the way of being in the world of, of, of different communities. And, and those are quite profound historic things. If you look at Europe now and the divisions that are opening up in Europe, it's quite clear some of those divisions go back hundreds and hundreds of years. The division between the north of Europe and the south of Europe was reflected over 500 years ago in the Reformation. The division between Eastern Europe and Western Europe was reflected almost a thousand years ago in 1054 with the Great Schism. All of these are very deep, profound things. They don't get resolved easily or quickly and they continue to affect things. I've heard a lot of people talking about Britain wanting to go down the road of Brexit, which, by the way, I very much regret and saying it's Britain looking for another empire. That doesn't make much sense to me because actually the Prime Minister is looking to keep people from the empire out, not bring them in. But there has been a Brexit before. It was Henry VIII who did it when he removed England from the Catholic Church. And if you talk to the Archbishop of Canterbury now, he thinks it was a very good idea. So these historic resonances are very often not short-term things but profoundly deep long-term things. And when we, we found that when we changed lots of other things, constitutions and institutions and human rights regulations and social and economic development, community development, policing, the administration of justice, all of these kinds of things, there still was a problem about people's way of being in the world. And we had thought, as John Hume famously said, that the French could be French and the Germans could be Germans and it would all be absolutely fine. But actually, we have to find some common ways of working together and feeling things together. And this is where I'm really very excited about some of the things the University of Ulster 
has picked up to do, because the Pro Vice Chancellor was speaking to you there about art and the arts. And indeed, the university has recently decided to appoint a senior lecturer in art therapy, something that there hasn't been anywhere else in, these, in this island. And that's really important because the person that's been appointed is very conscious of the use of art in dealing with conflict. And music, that's one of the things that we discovered here too, that, I mean, music's been a very divisive business. There were some marches that uh, would, would come past just the building that we're in here and down past a Catholic church and there would be all sorts of problems because these were young Protestant loyalists who were actually out to create a bit of difficulty for local Catholics. And so Eva went and started to work with these young loyalists and to help them to understand that their music could take them to different places and new places. And eventually some of them came back and said, you know what, we don't want to go on those marches anymore because it's much better for us to be able to go and engage with other people in music. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was able to be at an exhibition run by a young Syrian lawyer bringing art that is created in Aleppo and Damascus in the last few months in the middle of all the difficulty, stunning pieces of art that people were able to work creatively with even in the context of horrible violence or drama or poetry. In other words, we need to do all these practical, cerebral, behavioral, structural things, of course. But when it comes to changing attitudes and feelings and relationships, then some of these cultural things like art and music and drama and poetry are incredibly important to make the change because they are part of the essence of relation. We're not just cognitive beings. We're not just beings that behave. We are also people who feel things as individuals and as communities. You know, every day, there are people all around the world who are affected by being parts of communities and they don't even know the other people that are involved. Every Sunday morning, there are men all over the world who waken up depressed because Manchester United lost the football match the night before. Or more seriously, there are many people around the country who are waking up very sad because of the death of the owner of Leicester City Football Club in a helicopter crash. And even more seriously, there are young Muslims all around the world who react very adversely from Indonesia to Morocco to the United States whenever they hear about something horrible that has happened to some Muslim young people, say, in the Middle East. They don't even need to know where it happens. They feel something has happened with themselves. They identify that. They engage with that. And that's one of the really difficult things we're at everywhere in the world at the moment. People feeling that their identity, their community, their culture, what is important to them is under threat. And when you feel under that kind of existential threat, you think in a different way, you behave in a different way, and it's usually not a very constructive one. So it's really very important that those of us who are involved in addressing conflict all around the world come together and work together and build the networks because what is happening at the moment is these relationships are being broken and torn apart. Those of us that want to make peace need to build and work to keep these things together. And that's why it's wonderful to have you here in Belfast. We were encouraged in the past by things working in other places. We hope you will feel encouraged, not because we've solved all the problems, of course not. What relationship ever has all its problems solved? If you think you've got the problem and your relationship solved, your relationship's in trouble already. Right? Because it's a dynamic, organic thing. But it's also something that makes life worthwhile. Because in the end, strip it all back. Life is not about studying. Life is not about working. Life is not about all the amount of stuff you've got. Life is about relationships. Relationships with each other. Relationships with this world and universe in which we have been placed. Relationships that take us beyond all of that. And I hope today and over the next day or two, you get a chance to develop even more deeply some of the relationships that have already started and you find a lot of people around in Belfast wanting to welcome you to be part of a city 
It's finding slowly and in a hiccuping way its path out of conflict. You're welcome. Great to see you. Thank you very much.